Now there was a time when the number of router bits I had on hand was quaint. I mean, at that time, my router was powered by a horse running in circles. But Dremel bits, I've always had an abundance of those. You know how you buy a Dremel bit kit and you feel like a moron not knowing what most of them do? So I just put those in an organizer and we'll see those again later. Back to the router bits. As you know, they reproduce. Like rabbits maybe, but I don't know how they will. Point is, there was a time when I made a cutesy little router bit organizer tray. And then I made another. And over the years, my router bit collection began to grow. Here's one that held all three types of bits, eighth inch Dremel, as well as quarter and half inch router bits. And that turned out to be really handy. But that was so handy that I then wanted to have all the router bits close together where I could see them easily. The nature of router and Dremel bits, you don't necessarily know what you're looking for until you see it. Here's the next one that looks pretty cool, but it took a long time to make and having those shank sizes mixed was super annoying. So now I knew what I wanted and I was ready to try and make it happen. My objective was to make three trays that would hold all of my router and Dremel bits. One tray for the eighth inch shank bits, one for the quarter inch shank bits, and one for the half inch shank bits. But since I really didn't want to drill all those holes, I just let it sit on the back of my mind for a while, came up with some bad ideas, and then one that worked really well. Dados. The idea is simple. We take the shank diameter, cut a dado that's just a tiny bit narrower than the shank diameter, and then that shank can't go in the dado, but it can go in the intersection of two of those dados, which means super dense bit organizer trays that can be made crazy fast. So here are the trays I made about a year ago, the Dremel bits, the quarter inch, and the half inch. And after seeing how those have worked over the past year, I made a couple tweaks. And this past weekend, I made the final trays to fit this organizer here. Numbers. The half inch tray has 63 locations for bits. The quarter inch, 216. The eighth inch, 384. That was harder than I expected it to be. My calculator's in use, so I did that in my head, which to my surprise worked. Now hold on, let's not pass that up too quick. That's 384 holes, effectively, on a surface that is smaller than a sheet of paper. Then there's the added benefit that they're not actually holes. So you can put things like the wrenches or discs in here. Bust out some columns, and then you have a little tray for some of the things that don't fit in holes or grooves. Those 384 holes on this tray took less than five minutes to cut. No center punching, no drawing lines. I just used the measuring tape tape on my table saw sled and moved the board along incrementally. So for all three trays, cutting all the dados, changing blades, and sanding the tear out issues that I had, took 25 minutes. That's crazy. Now those 25 minutes don't include all of the figuring that was involved, so what I'll do now is give you the dimensions that I found to work well. Data widths, data depths, spacing between the datos for the different types of bits, and show you how to accomplish that, or give you a couple ideas at least. So let's start with material. I would not recommend MDF. Those little columns are breaking way too easily. And I'd recommend making these one and a half inches thick. That way there's plenty of support underneath the dados. Now, since this was my final project, I went with Baltic Birch. Just three half inch pieces to provide a really nice, stable platform. Now, if you glue up layers like I did, just be sure you have enough clamping pressure so that you don't have any issues with layer bonding. And my rubber clamps gave the level of consistency and pressure that I was looking for. But if this is your first time to do this, I would recommend just taking a 2x4, 2x6, use that, it's already one and a half inches anyway, 
Now I mentioned that the MDF was separating. Now that's a possibility with any of this. So if you have too narrow of columns or if you didn't glue up the layers of the Baltic birch well enough, you know, whatever, you might still have layer separating. So make sure that whatever edge you're gonna be grabbing to get this thing off the shelf, make sure you're not grabbing narrow columns. Now, as far as spacing goes, I didn't really care for the spacing between the bits so much as I did easy increments for easy cuts. So for the eighth and quarter inch bits, I used half inch increments. So I made my cuts at one, one and a half, two, two and a half, etc. And then for the half inch bits, I used one inch increments, you know, two, three, four, and so on. I think you could get away with making those closer together. Edit. When I was reviewing this footage, I noticed I accidentally followed the centimeter marks instead of the half inch marks for the Dremel bit trays, which is great news because a centimeter is less than half of an inch, which means more density, and those columns were plenty stable. Here are the specific data widths and depth of cut dimensions I found to work really well together. So take a screenshot or something, I'm not gonna read it to you, and then I'll move on and show you how I made those cuts. Creating the dados for the eighth and half inch bits is really straightforward, so let's start there. For the eighth inch bits, you need about a 0.094 or 330 seconds cut, which happens to be the width of a thin kerf saw blade like most of us have in our table saws. And the dados for the half inch bits are just about as easy. Using my Ashlin dado stack, I found that the two wings and the eighth inch chipper create quite the perfect combination. Now the dados for the quarter inch bit trays, yeah, not quite as straightforward, but I have a couple solutions or ideas for you. About a year ago when I made these prototypes, I found, but I don't think that solution's for everybody. Before you start stacking high-speed cutters together in a way that they weren't designed to stack. So I came up with another solution, not quite as convenient, but very safe. And that solution is to use the same thin kerf table saw blade that you just used for the Dremel bits, but make an extra cut that's 1 16th higher than the cut you just made. When you make a cut at two inches, then make one at two and one sixteenth. Two and a half, two and nine sixteenths. Three, three and one sixteenth. Three and a half, three and nine sixteenths, and so on. And that'll give you a nice dado. It's very safe and is still way faster than drilling holes by a long shot. So how about I wrap up with a few things that didn't seem to fit anywhere else. Right off the bat, I couldn't help but notice the air hose hanging there, which would make the perfect tripod. At least in theory. All right, now a glue up like this is very difficult to clamp without the layers shifting around during the clamping process. So what I do is I cut the pieces longer than I need, then put some brad nails in the ends, then just chop them off after the glue up. And this works really well, provided you use long enough nails to make it through all the layers, which I didn't do. See, for this type of glue up, it's really difficult to get the proper amount of pressure because there's a lot of surface area here and it's double decker. So you need a lot of pressure to get those layers to bond. Now, to be clear, a glue up like this doesn't always need a proper bond throughout. You put a bunch of clamps on here and only the places you clamp have a good bond. Well, that's usually enough to save the whole board because it's not gonna come apart as long as you have several good bonds within that area. But in this case, I'm cutting dados all over the place. And so the spot next to the weak bond can't save the weak bond. Therefore, this is a really good test of the effectiveness of this type of glue up. Maybe we can settle all the internet disputes about squeeze out right now, but probably not. As a new woodworker, everybody's saying, more clamps, more clamps, more clamps. You need more clamps. You need to be using more clamps. You need to properly clamp that. But there comes a time when you use a lot of clamps, you post a picture, and the other half of the internet speaks up. And suddenly they're like, whoa, 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 you can't do that. You're going to starve the glue joint. That glue up's going to fail. Now look, I do realize that starving glue joints is a real thing but it seems that it's only really a problem with glue ups where the glue can escape easily. 
And with this sort of glue up, the glue can't escape easily. And I consistently fail at this type of glue up. I always think I have enough clamps, enough pressure, but then after the fact I see a thick glue line indicating I didn't have enough pressure. So here's a little experiment or insult to science to simply illustrate that a little increase in the surface area causes considerably more resistance, causing the need for considerably more pressure. I mean, in this case, 30 pounds of pressure on the large dowel decreased the sticky tack by one millimeter, the small dowel, four millimeters. And if this sticky tack thing isn't unscientific enough, the entire van as a clamp thing may be invalid as well, because it's based on my presumption that the van is putting more pressure on it than the clamps I've been using. Now I have reason to think that, but I don't have numbers. And suddenly I'm realizing I'm sounding like a nerd. Ah, let's move on to something more tangible, more appropriate. Let's look at how many columns broke after that van glue up. Three. Okay, fine, four. If you count the other one that broke. So three were on the Dremel bit tray, one on the quarter inch router bit tray. Otherwise they held up amazingly well. 